Critical Incident Stress Management, CISM, um, is a comprehensive, integrated, systematic, uh, multi-component approach. There's a lot of pieces to it. If you think of it in terms of the word strategy, strategy is the big picture. Um, the tactics fit within it. So it's a comprehensive program. It has beginning, middle, ending, has things done before people get traumatized, like education, has things done uh, while they've been traumatized, like on-scene support services, um, and it has things that we do after people have been through a traumatic experience. And uh, the people we're talking about are emergency personnel. After a traumatic experience, we provide individual support, family support, we provide group support, um, and uh, we also provide organizational guidance and support so that the organization can help their personnel recover as quickly as possible. To answer the question of what is CISD, we have to start with what is the whole field. The, the whole field is crisis intervention. There's a large window of all kinds of tactics and strategies that we can use within the field of crisis intervention. Smaller is critical incident stress management. That's a bit more specific to what we do with a, a firefighter, paramedics, police officers. Uh, so it's much more specific. And then uh, within that larger field of critical incident stress management are individual tactics that we use. One of those tactics is critical incident stress debriefing, which is a uh, structured group intervention after a tragedy to help units re uh, respond to it and recover and re get themselves restored to unit cohesion and unit performance. That's the main focus of what we do with critical incident stress debriefing. And there's many, many other tactics within the CISM field. Critical Incident Stress Debriefing, also known as CISD, is a group uh, support process. It is not therapy. It is not designed as a cure. It's really designed for two main reasons. One is to restore people in a group, that is usually firefighters or police officers or paramedics, people in that group, restore them to the usual function and to help with restoration of unit cohesion. The reason we do this is because when people have been exposed to a traumatic experience, they tend to separate out and they hunker down, uh, they kind of cut everybody else off, they think they're the only ones going through things, and a group process helps people to understand, I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one going through this, my buddies are going through it, and if we can go through this together, then we can recover together faster. CISD differs from other types of tactics in that, first of all, it's focused around a group, and it's got to be a group that's had a roughly equal exposure to the traumatic event. Um, and the other thing about it is that it's designed to uh, enhance recovery. But there are times when we need to do other things, one-on-one -on -one or family support or whatever. But this uh, critical incident stress debriefing is designed mostly to support people after they've been traumatized, roughly same exposure to trauma, but they have to be a homogeneous group in order to be able to use the process. Critical incident stress debriefing is not for the fire victim, the person who got burned. It's for the firefighters who have care for and transport that person. Um, it's for the secondary folks. It is not a therapy. It's not a cure. Uh, it will help to restore people to their normal functions, get them back on a job, uh, keep them healthy, functional, uh, and able to go on and do the next job. Critical incident stress debriefing is not a treatment. It's not a therapy, it was never designed for that. It's designed to help healthy people get restored to normal, healthy function. That's really what it's about. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a very complex entity. Uh, does CISD have a potential to prevent it? Probably, but it's a secondary prevention. It's not a primary prevention. In other words, primary prevention is stop smoking. You get immediate health benefit. Secondary prevention is if you do some things, it might not lead to something else. So that if it has a preventative role, it's a secondary prevention, not primary. Uh, but it really is not a program of therapy. It's a program of support to help people get re, uh, restored to normal, healthy function. The primary function of critical incident stress debriefing is not to um, eliminate post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, we're doing uh, critical incident stress debriefing so early that hasn't even become a factor yet. We're trying to get healthy people restored to healthy function. We're trying to get people back to their jobs. We're trying to get people back to their families uh, to do the things that uh, they were quite able to do uh, before the traumatic event happened in their career. The success of critical incident stress debriefing is not measured in uh, whether or not somebody gets post-traumatic stress disorder. The success really is getting people back to function, back to their work, back on their jobs, 
back to working with your colleagues in the firehouse or the police station or in the emergency services arena, uh, the success of critical incident stress debriefing is restoration to as near normal function as possible in the aftermath of a tragedy. CISD is not a form of psychotherapy. It was never designed to be a psychotherapy. It's not a substitute for or a replacement for psychotherapy. If people need therapy when they come to a critical incident stress debriefing, they're likely to need therapy after we finish. What critical incident stress debriefing is all about is getting people back to work, getting back to their lives, getting back to taking care of and being with their families. Uh, so it is a critical incident stress debriefing is a support function it is not a therapy function. Uh, it may have some therapeutic elements, but that doesn't mean it's therapy. It's just simply there to help people, healthy people, get restored to their normal healthy functions on their job and in their homes. Keep in mind that a critical incident stress debriefing is not about cure. It's about restoration of people to function. So we measure success by lowered sick time utilization. We measure success uh, by lowered premature retirements, normal, nor normalizing the experience so that people still have the symptoms but they're able to go back to work knowing that they're normal. So uh, that's basically how you measure the success. An example would be uh, a business, for instance, where the co-workers witnessed a suicide at the workplace. Um, a support team came in, provided uh, information. The very next morning they came back, did a critical incident stress debriefing. People who are dysfunctional on the job, unable to do their job, uh, within a few hours of that intervention were able to have lunch and return to work as if it was a normal day's work. Uh, again, it reduced um, the feelings of abnormality and made them normal. It was normal to have these reactions. We didn't take away the reactions, we helped them to understand the reactions and to understand they were not going crazy, they were having a normal response to a terribly abnormal event. When a critical incident stress team uh, estimates that uh, the deep critical incident stress debriefing is going to be the best approach, there are several things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, uh, it is a group process. It can take anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on how complex the situation is. Uh, you have a trained team of people, which includes one mental health professional and at least one or two peer support personnel uh, who work together on a team. And uh, the critical incident stress debriefing uh, usually uh, takes place not on the same day of the event, but usually a couple of days after the event. So um, those are some of the mechanics of it uh, when, when we're working with a debriefing process. There are several important things to keep in mind when a critical incident stress debriefing is being done. One is the situation has to be complete, at least reasonably complete, so that the main distressing events are now in the past. So we normally we're waiting at least 24 hours to do it, sometimes more. Um, it has to be a homogeneous group, which means you don't want to mix group. You don't want to have all different kinds of agencies participating at the same time unless they have the same exact exposure, which they usually don't. And then you have to have roughly the same exposure to the event, okay? Uh, so homogeneous group, situation complete, and roughly equal exposure to the traumatic event. Those are the things that usually count the most when a debriefing is being set up. We've seen no evidence that the critical incident stress debriefing re-traumatizes people if a couple of conditions are kept in place. One, and most important, that the personnel who are providing are properly trained to do so. The second major piece that prevents this uh, from causing damage is that people who provide it need to follow the, the specific guidelines that have been established and, and which we train people to use. So, uh, they, they have to basically uh, follow the guidelines and be trained to do it. If they're doing that, there is no evidence that this has caused harm. If you use any tool uh, wrongly, or if it's used by a person not trained to use that tool, damage can be done. Critical incident stress debriefing is designed to be done by people who are properly trained, who follow the rules. So, in other words, if you're trying to use a hammer where a screwdriver should be utilized, you're probably going to mess up your wall. In this case, if you used the wrong uh, kinds of procedures uh, within a debriefing, you're likely to do some harm. Again, don't violate procedures and make sure people who do it are properly trained to do it and there will be no harm.
Some studies uh, have um, uh, used the model the way it was designed, and uh, they probably have positive outcomes. Uh, the studies uh, in the military certainly do that. Um, some studies were done um, by people who violated the procedures, and when they did that, they found negative outcomes, and uh, quite a few of the studies have that. Some studies were done on primary victims who were in the hospital in pain, often on medications, uh, and that certainly violates the procedures. Other studies were done um, on people who um, were really inappropriate victims, such as birth mothers. It's not what the critical incident stress debriefing with process was designed for. Um, and then some of the studies were done on, um, uh, on personnel who it should have been, such as military personnel, and those studies have a very positive outcome. I, I think we can summarize an answer to that by saying that uh, when people have applied the model according to its original design, uh, that it seems to work well. When people have applied the model in a way that is not in concert with the original design, uh, that we then send, tend to have some negative outcomes. It's a, it's a variation in the way the applications are made. Studies that followed procedures had properly trained providers of the services and were targeted towards populations for which the interventions were actually designed. Those studies show positive outcome. One really interesting study that, that gives us a good insight into this is uh, the German air traffic control system for 10 years had been following their personnel. Every time they had two blips on a radar scope come together, that's, that's a very scary event for them. Uh, they lost time from work every time, uh, and on average, they were losing three days for every air traffic controller involved in a loss of, what they call it technically, is a loss of separation in the sky. In 1997, they put in a critical incident stress management program. Uh, they properly trained their people, they followed procedures, and uh, what they have found since 1997 is there has not been a single day uh, lost time from work in the air traffic control system in Germany uh, once they put this peer support program in place. It's, it's peer run, um, it uses mental health backup, but it is a very strong peer support program. It makes a huge difference. A second good example will be some studies done by Amy Adler with the United States military and her colleagues. Uh, they uh, did work with thousands of troops, up around 25,000 troops, and uh, they did not receive negative reports from anybody going through a critical incident stress debriefing. In fact, uh, they preferred that intervention over a simple uh, classroom presentation called stress management class. Um, another example would be uh, some studies done after the World Trade Center attack in the United States um, in which uh, Boscarino and his colleagues looked at um, the differences between people who are receiving support services from colleagues and support services from mental health professionals. And in that case, the colleagues actually had stronger impact uh, on supporting their personnel and, and having them recover than did the mental health professionals. Okay, the bottom line on all these studies that have been done is number one, if we have properly trained people, number two, who follow the procedures and protocols, and number three, who target their interventions at the right target populations, we do not have negative outcome studies from those kinds of interventions. That is the bottom line. In critical incident stress management, every once in a while we identify somebody who's not getting better. I mean, that's what, what we hope, but if they're not, what do we do next? Uh, what we train our teams to do is to recognize that and to be able to refer those people to appropriate mental health services so if they need therapy, they can get that therapy. So uh, we want to be linked uh, from critical incident stress management team into uh, therapy if that should be necessary. Both CISD and peer-to-peer -peer are under the umbrella of critical incident stress management. CISD is a group intervention, it's a group crisis intervention, and peer-to-peer -peer is an individual assisting another individual. Uh, CISM and psychotherapy are not related, neither is CISD and psychotherapy, they're not related at all. Um, we train our personnel that if they find somebody who needs a referral for psychotherapy, they'll get that referral. But we're not going to be doing psychotherapy in the field, we're not doing that in the firehouse, or we're not doing that in the police station. Uh, psychotherapy is a different experience altogether, done by a trained therapist under very carefully controlled conditions, uh, not the kind of stuff we're working with in the field.
The cop to cop program is the same as uh, peer to peer. It's just that it's a popular name on the East Coast, especially in the state of New Jersey. Uh, but it really means the same thing. It's one peer support person helping uh, a person who's involved in an organization where they had a traumatic event. Uh, you may have heard a lot about psychological first aid. Psychological first aid is not a substitute for critical incident stress management. It's really under the fabric of critical incident stress management. And uh, psychological first aid was developed for mass casualty care. Uh, it has four major components. Number one is they want to have uh, people get general support, shelter, food, uh, fluids, those kinds of things. Um, provide information to the people who are distressed. Uh, next thing, the third thing is to identify people who uh, need a referral and to support them on an individual basis until a referral could be made. So it's really for mass casualty care. The, the critical incident stress debriefing is actually a group uh, intervention. It has seven steps to it. And uh, a trained team coming into the room, sitting down with the personnel, would uh, tell them who they are, why they're there, uh, give them an introduction. Next, they would ask the participants to describe what happened, a uh, little bit of the details so that they know what's going on. It doesn't have to be excessive detail, but just enough to tell the story of what happened in the situation. Then uh, the team will ask them to describe uh, the participants' experience of the event, that is their thoughts, their impressions, as they went through the situation. And the next step in the process is to ask them to um, describe the worst part for them. The worst part for me was, is the question that's often asked there. And it gets their reactions, the most, uh, the most powerful reactions that they had to the event. Next after that, the team members asked them to describe signals of distress that the participants in the event went through and what they're experiencing now. And that might be signals where of distress like they're not sleeping very well or uh, they're angry at uh, their family or whatever. Um, and then teaching, we try to normalize the experience and help them to understand the steps that they might need to take uh, to recover from this so that they can re-enter their uh, normal job, normal home experience. So that re-entry is called a summary and the summary is where we have a question answer period and we kind of summarize some of the material that we covered in the, um, the other six steps of the, of the critical incident stress debriefing. The idea being that once we're finished this, we want them on the road to recovery. They may not be fully recovered at this time, but we definitely want them to be moving down towards that recovery process. Uh, one of the things that's really important uh, about the debriefing process is the second step. That's where people are telling us what they did and where they did it and why they did it. Uh, many times in these situations, people have no idea why this has taken so long. Uh, what, where is my buddy? I'm waiting for help on this situation and that situation. Um, and um, one example, we had um, a fire unit dealing with uh, uh, a bundle of, of a blanket in the, in the, in the, um, the roadway. And um, everybody was waiting for him to bring a piece of equipment over so they can do their part of the mission. And he was investigating the blanket because it actually contained the body of a small infant. So he was delayed getting over to them. Well, they were angry at him because he was looking at this child. They didn't know that he was looking at a child. They thought he was kind of just slowing down and looking at some blanket or something. They didn't know there was a child in it. He was checking the child to see if there was any signs of life. Once he explained that, they were, oh, okay, now we understand why it took you so long to bring that tool over to us. Okay, so the brief situation review sometimes fills in the blanks where people don't have the total picture. It's almost like a puzzle. They get this piece and that piece and that piece, but until somebody else says, hey, this is what happened to me during the event, they don't get all of that connected together into one big picture. Connecting all the dots, making all the puzzle pieces fit together is extremely important because what it does is it helps people not to carry um, unnecessary guilt feelings, anger, frustration, all those things are not being resolved until they get the whole picture of what happened. So that, that piece of this uh, process is extremely important, is building the entire picture so that everybody has the same information. When someone leaves the critical incident stress debriefing and their issues have not been resolved yet, uh, that's where CISM as an overall umbrella comes in handy because we do one-on-ones with them, we check on their welfare. If they get home and the family says he's not 
together. He's not fixed up. He's still really having a bad time, and they can they get him either to connect with us or they do. Then we go into family support. Plus, we can provide additional resources. And if that individual needs therapy, that's where the referral would come in. So, one of the very important things about this is that you don't leave uh, the pieces unresolved. If it's not getting fixed one way, we have to find another way to enter the picture and try to find some resolution for that person. So, what I just said about needing to follow through with these things. Um, it's important to recognize because CISD is one piece of a lot of pieces and if we're not getting a resolution in the critical incident stress debriefing, then we have critical incident stress management services, many of them to fall back on to make sure that we find as much resolution for every individual involved as possible. As important as the critical incident stress debriefing is, it's not the only tool in the CISM toolbox and uh, personnel on those teams need to be trained to use all of the tools when appropriate uh, to make sure that every individual who we come in contact with has the opportunity to recover from a traumatic experience. For more information on starting a team or helping your team get additional information and education, contact the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. Uh, they have resources to assist. They uh, have over 46 different courses that they teach. They also provide training to over 30,000 people in 28 nations around the world. So good organization to get some information about how to develop and maintain your team. The International Critical Incident Stress Foundation has uh, trained over 1,500 critical incident stress management teams. They operate in 28 nations around the world. Uh, the United Nations has adopted the models that the uh, foundation presents and they are now using it internally with their own personnel in 110 nations. So uh, this is a place to get additional information if you're interested in developing a team, uh, training a team, and, tra and getting your people more proficient in what they do, International Critical Incident Stress Foundation.